stuff, and I've got a sixth grader and eighth grader, and I ask myself, are they ever going to make it in the world? And the, the one thing, right, I, right, you're all teachers here, so like, yeah, I'm wondering the same thing, and Eric's got kids. You know, the one thing is, I was thinking, you know, all of us in this room, somehow we made it. I, I don't know how, right? I mean, we, we probably all had our times, so, you know, it wasn't video games then, but whatever it was. And I'm sure our parents were asking the same questions about us, and somehow we all made it. So that's the one thing that gives me comfort uh, when, when I uh, think about my kids. Some, somehow I made it, so they're going to also. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mentioned a lot of common themes. Actually, um, and I'll, I'll talk about this in, in my, uh, 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 one of my slides about my, my STEM journey. So I was in the Navy and I served in the submarine force. I had no idea that the father of the nuclear Navy, Navy Admiral Rickover, was actually one of the fathers also of this program. And so, uh, you know, there's a piece where it kind of all comes together and obviously I could relate a lot to what Aaron said, relate a lot to what Yvonne said. Um, and, and also, uh, Whitney will notice a lot of parallels because I work in the defense community. Uh, Harris Corporation is a, um, is, is a top ten defense company. We make, uh, Harris is known for communications. And, oh, is there a clicker behind me? Yeah. Harris is known for communications. Um, uh, and, and, and I'll talk a little bit about what Harris does in each of these four areas. Um, but they acquired a company called Excellus, and people in the Roanoke Valley might know that that company here used to be called ITT. Yeah. Uh, so I work on Plantation Road, um, worked for ITT, that's what it was when I started there in 2008. Um, and then we changed names and changed names again just a year ago. We're actually coming up on our first anniversary as Harris Corporation. So I'm going to talk about Harris Corporation. It essentially was the defense side of ITT spun off and became Excellus. Harris acquired all of Excellus, and together we're, we're a top 10 defense manufacturer. What we do here in the, in the Roanoke Valley, we make night vision goggles, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but the parallel to Whitney, the space and intelligence systems, that's why the only person learned to raise their hand when uh, asked what an image scientist, uh, who knows what an image scientist does? Uh, um, they, we have a ton of them, and actually recruit from Rochester Institute of Technology, because that business is based in Rochester, New York. So, so there's a, a, a lot of parallels there. Um, if you've ever watched the news and the weather, uh, you've actually been watching an image from a, a satellite payload that came from ITT, which is now Harris. If you um, go, to, go to Google Earth, uh, that's also an image that came from ITT, which is now Harris. And if you've ever used a GPS, um, that payload, every single GPS payload had some ITT, now Harris, uh, um, uh, components on that payload. Um, so that's the space and intelligence. We also do stuff in um, electronic systems. That's electronic warfare, undersea warfare, uh, critical networks. Uh, we have a, a lot of the um, air traffic management uh, with the FAA. Uh, we have a program with them. And then we have a lot of engineering and IT support for government agencies. So you see over on the left where, where I work in night vision here in Roanoke, that's in, as part of communication systems. Uh, there's also a company in Lynchburg, Harris, um, it's the public safety, um, and I think it's uh, public safety and professional communication. So they make radios for some, uh, first responders, firemen, um, police, and uh, they also offer some STEM programs, which I'll talk to, and, and you know, again, maybe we can take advantage. So we'll talk a little bit briefly about night vision, all right, just so uh, you know, uh, tell you about how it works. Um, it's uh, it's image intensification, um, and I am not a physicist. I am not an image scientist, so I'm just going to tell you what I know about it, um, and that is at, uh, from a mechanical engineer's perspective, because uh, that's what I got my degree in. Um, so, what, what uh, image intensification does is it takes the um, photons that are out there, already readily available um, at night, and they can come from anywhere. They can come from city skylights, they can come from stars, they can come from the moon. Um, but there's ambient light that's, that's out there in the atmosphere at night. Where this doesn't work is in a cave, in, in a building where you don't have windows, where there's no ambient light. So this is not like infrared technology, which is trying to pick up on the wavelengths of heat. This is actually taking ambient light and what it does, it, it, uh, we have a cathode, the photocathode takes that ambient light, converts it to electrons, we have a, a fiber optic microchannel plate, and then those electrons hit the walls of the microchannel plate as they're passing through, and then 
they release other electrons. Those electrons contact other walls of the microchannel plate, release other electrons, and all of that happens in about that big um, of space. Those electrons then come out and they hit a, a screen, which is essentially a um, piece of glass, but it's coated with phosphor, just uh, the element phosphor, and it's a certain um, element of, uh, yeah, certain compound of phosphor. But it's just brushed, it's a powder that's brushed on the screen. And when it hits that, it contacts that, those electrons uh, converted back into photons, and that's what you see. So you see the green imagery, if you watch movies about, you know, with night vision, um, that's the green imagery that you see. Uh, you can also use other types of phosphor. You could make it blue, you could make it red, you can make it white. A lot of studies have gone uh, into why green is better, and it's just less fatigue um, on the human eye, so that's why uh, the green image is better. Um, so that's what we do. We make image intensifier tubes, and we call them tubes because it's actually a vacuum tube. And just like the old CRT uh, televisions, and I say that to my uh, kids, and they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, tubes, just like the old TVs. You know, that's why they're called tubes. What? Right. Yeah, no idea. Um, okay, so, um, so I want to talk about my STEM journey, and I'll, I'll move to the other side a little bit here, just to, to mix it up a little bit. Um, and again, you'll hear some repeats, you'll hear some, um, some common, uh, common themes here. Um, you'll be a problem solver. So, so when I put this together, you know, similar to, to the rest of the group, I asked um, not only, uh, you know, about my STEM journey, but what am I looking for as an employer? Um, so, uh, running business, have a ton of engineers, and uh, as Whitney knows, most of them are men. Um, so I have a daughter who's, um, who's uh, bright and wants to be a musician, but that's cool, that's fine. But do well in math and science just in case, right? Go to the STEM program, she's going into ninth grade next year, she signed up, and you know, all that, it's great. So, you know, these are some of the things I thought about, what would I want to tell, you know, tell my kids, and I thought about, maybe I should have this talk with my kids, that's probably a good idea. Um, but also, I was thinking about it as an employer, um, because believe it or not, adults are still working on this stuff. Okay, I have, I do have these conversations, I see a lot of head nods, right? I have these conversations with people that are older than I am that I work with, because they just didn't learn it early enough enough. So, so my ask, you know, and I'll talk through these, why these are important to me, because I didn't learn early enough. It took me a while to learn these topics. And so I'll share that part with you and, you know, it maybe help make the connection there. So word problems, yeah, I hated word problems. Uh, you know, I, it took me a long time to figure out, actually, the world isn't an equation that just, you know, uh, you can plug in and, and solve for A, right? I mean, the world isn't like that. And you don't realize that as a student until you actually get into the real world. And so, um, you know, anything you can do to help and uh, um, help make that you know make that connection for students early in life. And so, obviously, I'm not doing a good job with my kids um, because, like, that, yeah, 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 whatever, right? That's what they do when I'm like, oh, no, word problems are great. This is how life really is, right? But that's not what they want to do. They want to solve for X or solve for A. Um, so, how do you how do you get your students to love uh, word problems? And then take it a step further. How do you get them to be problem solvers versus problem identifiers? That's one of the things that I experience. I have a lot of people I work with that are really good at, uh, at, at identifying problems. Um, but the, the follow-up to that is, well, what do you think we should do about it? And that's where it typically falls apart. Well, that's what I was telling you, right? That's what I wanted you to figure it out. Well, no, I mean, put some thought into it. Take some initiative, all right? There's, there's a piece of be a problem solver that's about initiative. Identify a problem and then come with a solution, okay? How data is communicated matters. Uh, again, I'm, I, I'm a math guy. Actually, I took my uh, 11th grade, uh, I think it was like a you know, vocation survey quiz, something I did in 11th grade, and it said, uh, the results came back and said you should be an actuary. I have no idea what an actuary was. Right? So like, yeah, yeah. Well, one, right, do you like working with people? No. Do you like math? Yes. Do you like numbers? Yes. Okay, you should be an actuary so you can just go sit in an office and look at numbers all day. Um, and we'll get to, get to the rest of it. So you're like, what are you doing here? Why are you doing this? Uh, you know, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but how data is communicated matters. And, and I hated English literature. That's part of the reason it said I should be an actuary. But I was taking an AP English class in 11th grade. And I was doing the bare minimum just to get by. Um, I didn't really like the class because I'm not a, um, I'm just a pretty basic 
person, right? I, I, I don't like trying to make emotional connections and things, and that was really hard and challenging for me, okay? But my 11th grade AP English teacher challenged me and, and said, Eric, I'm not going to give you a beat. You're going to have to work for this. You're going to have to step outside of your comfort zone. You're going to have to start making some emotional connections with this, I think it was like, um, Emily Bronte, what was the, uh, Weathering, well, Weathering Heights, that's really, oh my gosh, oh, that was awesome, so, anyway, oh, but anyway, but she forced me to step out of my comfort zone and make some emotional connections, and, and that stuck with me, because we're all humans, and, and we make emotional connections, and I didn't realize that in 11th grade, but I, I look back on that, and, and uh, I really appreciate that, because when you're trying to sell something, and, and, and all of us do it. I'm trying to sell stuff to my kids to convince them how to be better people. You're trying to sell stuff to your students. Students, You might not call it selling, but it is. You're trying to get them to buy into what you're selling. Um, I have engineers that they can come to me, right, and they give me a, ta a, a table of data. What do you want me to do with it, right? What is this? All right, I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm not, uh, you know, I don't have, uh, you know, I can't do, like, you know, the whole... Now, ones and zeros and all of a sudden make sense of this. How you communicate it matters. Bring me a graph, right? Graph it out for me. Show me some way, some other visual, and then don't just hand it to me. What do you think, right? You've got to talk me through it. And if you talk me through it sounding like you're disinterested, I'm going to be disinterested. If you talk me through it like you're passionate about it and think it's a good idea, I'm naturally going to react to that. I'm naturally going to think it's a good idea. So how you communicate the data matters, and I can't draw, I can't sing, I can't play an instrument. Again, I was a pretty plain uh, person in, in high school, just like math, just wanted to keep to myself. Um, but somehow I married a woman who, <laughs> who is artistically talented. And I've got kids who are musically talented, they write music, they play instruments, I don't know how they do it. It just, it, it boggles my mind. And I share that with you because I learn from them. I learn from them how to connect with people in ways that I didn't appreciate. My, my sixth grader did a stop motion video for one of his science projects. I, you know, I was like, I didn't even know you could do that. And he you know, does it on his iPad. And I'm like, wow, what a phenomenal way to communicate science in a stop motion video. I mean, I never in a million years would I have been able to do that. And so I'm like, wow, you know, there's other ways to communicate. And again, I say a chart, a graph, um, but how you communicate with your with your verbal skills, your nonverbal um, videos. I mean, we just live in the digital age. Whatever you can do to help your students as they're going through their curriculum, also practice that communication side. All right, the public speaking side uh, is very important. So, um, you know, kind of moving into the uh, the next next part, leadership is learned. So. So I was an introvert growing up, I wanted to keep to myself, and somehow I just kept getting pushed, right? You know, somebody would push me, somebody would um, pull me in, into positions. One, I like to play sports. So I played sports, and, you know, just somehow, you know, you're, you're captain of the team, you know, no one else wants to do it, so you're stuck with it. And, and I learned to be a leader. Um, I didn't... I didn't know that, but it was... And, and I wouldn't have done it if someone didn't make me, if I didn't have that coach. Pulling me, if I didn't have the teacher making me. So, you know, that, that's who that was me over there that said, uh, so I can't remember what the question was, but I was like, make them do it, right? Just make them, right? You almost, sometimes, not everybody's an extrovert, and not everybody is a natural step up and take charge and, yeah, I want to do it. Some people need to be pulled along the way, and I was one, I was one of those kids. I needed a push. Um, I did, you know, a little bit about my background. So, you know, from that, I, I went to the Naval Academy. It was in the submarine force, so that's why, you know, the connection with Admiral Rickover. Did that for a few years. Um, learned about nuclear engineering. Decided I never wanted to do that again. Oh my gosh! I mean, that was just misery. And then, um, uh, I, so I got out of that as fast as I could, and, and didn't want to go work for a nuclear power plant. So I joined a pump company, and. Um, in upstate New York, actually, it was between Rochester and Syracuse in Seneca Falls, and I, I lived in Geneva, um, up there in New York. Uh, so it worked for Gould's Pumps. If anybody has a well pump or a sewage pump, you might have a Gould's Pumps. I did nothing on that. Uh, you know, I, I, what, what they learned, they brought me in as a mechanical engineer because that was my degree. 
And, you know, so I started playing with the, the CAD tools at the time. And, um, yeah, I went to my boss about six months into it and said, you know, actually, you could probably hire a 22-year-old out of RIT to come and do a better job than I'm doing right now. What else should we do with this, right? And, um, and so I got into, I got into, actually, product management. So I, I had some leadership skills um, because I had, you know, a little bit forced through high school, went to the Naval Academy. It was a natural training ground for leadership. Thrown into the Navy as a 22, 23-year-old leading a team. And some of those people are 40, 45 years old. Some of them, some are younger than I was, but it was a mix. And so leadership is learned. And I learned that along the way. And I, and I went to my boss and I'm like, you know, I think I've got some skills here because I'm seeing a, a lot of people that identify problems but don't bring up solutions. And I see that um, maybe, you know, we, we have problems communicating. I think I, I'm a good communicator, but I can apply my leadership, leadership skills in a different way. So. And, and to help the business. So I got into um, product management, marketing, strategy development, went on, came here in 2008, um, and uh, you know, somehow, uh, you know, just luck would have it, uh, I, I'm general manager of the business, but it, you know, it kind of all just, um, it, it all happened. I, I don't want to say it was, it was random, um, but it definitely had to do with the leadership skills, and I look back on, you know, that coach that pulled me along the way when I was, uh, when I was and then the last thing, failure isn't a bad word. It took me a long time to learn that one. Uh, that one is a, you know, you've got to take some risk. risk. And, I, and I learned it from when I did say, okay, I'll do it. And yeah, I didn't do so well. And, and then I'm like, okay, so how can I do better? Because, you know, that bothered me and I wanted to try it again so that I would do it right. And so, um, but, it, but, but I know there are people out there and I look at my sixth grader and eighth grader and I know some of this applies to them. They don't want to volunteer or step into a roles that make them uncomfortable. Do some of that because they're afraid of failure. And so, you know, I, I you know, try and work with my kids and, and talk, but, but I know it's, it's human nature, right? We don't want to fail. It doesn't feel good. Uh, so, tremendous amount of learning. The most learning we can have as, uh, as people and as adults, and this is what I talk to my engineering team about, is fail. Fail. It's okay. What do we learn from it and how can we get better? And so, you know, what can you guys do in the classroom to help pull that along? So the last couple of minutes here, um, support programs for Harris, what we've got. Um, we don't do any of this in Roanoke. Okay, we've only been part of Harris for a year, but um, there are some activities. The Lynchburg site that I mentioned, they've been running programs like this, the internship and Shark Tank type things, <coughs> local panels and seminars, uh, student design challenges, STEM kits for children. We don't do them in Roanoke right now. Uh, we are looking at these programs for next year. Uh, so that they would be um, available to the local community. Uh, but Lynchburg is running all four of these programs right now. And the last slide here, just what we do do, um, you know, we, we, we're still transitioning to the Harris Park, but what we do do is we heavily support the, the Science Museum. Um, if you haven't been to the Science Museum in a long time, it's changed. It, it's, um, and and, there, and we have a, there's a new um, executive director there that's uh, implementing even more exhibits, newer exhibits, and, and uh, you know, really fantastic. So. Um, take advantage of some of the programs at the Science Museum. We support them heavily. There's the Apple Ridge Farms uh, Summer Camp Program. And then, um, if any of your schools have a robotics team, we happen to sponsor the James River Robotics Team. They put a little hair sticker on their you know, robot when it goes into competitions. But, um, you know, if you've got a robotics team, uh, you know, we're happy to support the local community. And, uh, you know, it's part of our culture. It's part of who we are to support the STEM programs in the region. And that's all I got. Any questions?